Hello. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure to have this session with the wonderful filmmaker, Stefani Rotman. And equally great to have the old friend, good friend of the festival, Dave Kerr from the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, moderating it. Good afternoon. Well, Stephanie is an old, old friend of mine, and I hate to say how long I've known her, but uh, I know her quite well, and I know she is a woman of great modesty and reserve, so we will approach this a little obliquely, shall we? It's, uh, I think everyone who sees these films is, is struck by uh, how unusual they are, how beautiful they are, how free-spirited they are, and maybe you could set up some of the uh, conditions under which they were made and how that particular kind of freedom was possible for you. Um, in retrospect, uh, I realize how much freedom I had. Um, I, I was thinking about this the other day before I came to Bologna. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I, of course, didn't realize it at the time because the kinds of films I was making today are described by historians as second wave exploitation. When I first started making films, I didn't even realize I was making exploitation films. I thought I was making what were called modest, low budget program pictures, the kind that had taken over from what were B pictures in the 1930s and 40s in Hollywood, the le less expensive pictures that were uh, made without uh, stars uh, to fill a, uh, a program out. Um, <clears throat> then uh, I made uh, the first picture that I made for New World Pictures, uh, which was uh, founded by Roger Corman, and I got a review in the uh, film uh, journal called Daily Variety, and uh, it was a very nice review, but the reviewer said, this is an exploitation film, for sure, and I, I was quite astonished. Uh, because the word exploit uh, is a very, in many ways, offensive word. It means take advantage, taking advantage of something, something else. But I, I just very briefly would like to tell you the history of the term in terms of filmmaking. Uh, it started uh, really when films started to be advertised. It was another word for advertising. The, uh, advertising was often called the exploitation. And uh, then after a while, um, <clears throat> they, uh, the meaning began to change because while there were studio pictures, there were also films made in Hollywood along what was called Poverty Row. And these films um, uh, were, uh, did not have stars. And as a consequence, they had to be more transgressive. They had to be more, uh, they had to offer something that you couldn't see with the nice films with stars. And so uh, they became in many ways worse and worse. And uh, for example, when it came to smoking marijuana, they, they would talk about the horrors of doing so, but they would talk about it and they would talk about, you know, what people Wearing would- Wearing lingerie. Be. You would know that better yes. than me. <laughs> Frequently wearing lingerie. <laughs> and uh, then there um, were films about, there was a film that I remember as a very little girl called Mom and Dad, which was uh, about uh, what we then called venereal disease. Today we call it PTSD, I believe. STD. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it, it, it was the bad stuff you know, that came from having sex. And um, so, uh, you know, it, it was so sh shown, and this was never done in America, to segregated audiences. Men could see it in one group and women could see it in another, which of course was an exploitation act to make people think, oh, this is so naughty, you know, the sexes can't even watch it together. <clears throat> and so it went until the, um, late 1960s, 
when Roger Corman started making very low budget films independently. And uh, he um, began to make ones that gained a certain popularity. He became very wealthy. He decided, and he did go on to direct uh, uh, several studio, major studio films. And he was a very good director, I can tell you that, because I worked for him as his assistant uh, for a short period of time. And um, <clears throat> then uh, he started New World Pictures. And I had the honor to be the first person to direct a film which was uh, financed in part by him and in part by regional sub-distributors of films. Now, these were not the studio's distributors. These were people who distributed independent films. And that meant documentaries, that meant uh, exploitation films, that made everything they could get their hand on, hands on that wasn't from the studios. So um, <clears throat> the first film I made was called the stu stu not the very first film I made, but the one that uh, I made for his studio was called The Student Nurses. And uh, Roger uh, spoke to me and my producer and co-writer, my husband, Charles Swartz, and said, what you need to do is make a film that has lots of nudity in it. Uh, we couldn't really portray sex in the times that I made films, for which I'm very grateful because it is a monotonous scene to watch, I must say. We had to use more imagination. We had to be more sensuous and suggestive. Uh, so anyway, um, he said, it's got to have violence, and after that, you're on your own. Now, that's freedom, let me tell you. So we delivered sex, we delivered violence, and uh, we were able to construct a story that dealt with the issues of the time, which if you ever see the film, you'll discover many of which are still the issues of your time. Um, and uh, that was uh, how I got started. Mm -hmm. exploitation. 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 That's all I ever made was mm -hmm. exploitation. It I sounds never... very harsh, but uh, it was really a separate marketplace. Films that were made for drive-ins, not a phenomenon you had in Europe, but people would drive their cars into large lots in front of movie screens. And this is very popular for teenagers to go to make out and that kind of stuff. Uh, they had discount theaters in the bigger cities. A normal movie would cost you $3. The New World Theater would cost you $2. Uh, so it was a very different kind of audience, and mostly it was uh, an audience that was not, uh, I say, critically engaged with the work. So it, uh, it takes a while to emerge. That was the same generation that produced Joe Dante, and oh God, uh, I mean, a lot of people passed through there. And it was a great school, and for some reason, uh, Stephanie wasn't really allowed to graduate from that school for reasons that are not really clear. But she went on and made a number of films on her own volition after Corman. Maybe you could tell us about Dimension Pictures and that how that came to be. Well, Dimension Pictures was broken off from uh, <clears throat> New World Pictures uh, for the reason that drives most things in this world, money. <laughs> um, Dimension Pictures was financed by a man who the uh, head of Dimension Pictures met at a racetrack and they struck up a conversation and he turned out to be a very wealthy man who decided that he wanted to invest in motion pictures. Uh, always a mistake, but people, you know, that's kept a secret <laughs> because it's such a risk. Uh, so anyway, um, <clears throat> He was uh, himself a producer and uh, distributor, the man who founded Dimension Pictures uh, in a company called Wilner Brothers, who made in the 1950s a lot of films uh, in Italy that were distributed in the United States. And uh, in fact, he was the one who uh, 
oh, I'm going to mispronounce his name now, introduced me to the work of Mario Bava, I believe it is, yes, um, who was a teeny bit of an inspiration for me for one of my films. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so he found a dimension pictures, and uh, as wonderful as Roger had been to me, and he was my only mentor, gave me the only, uh, he was the only person in the world who would give me the job that he gave me, um, <clears throat> did not pay very well. And uh, my husband and I had to, you know, have enough to make a living. And so this man, Lawrence Wohler, uh, offered us a job working for him. Uh, my husband had the productions and the two of us to make uh, films for them. And so the first film we uh, made for them uh, was uh, called Group Marriage, and uh, <clears throat> it showed here yesterday. Um, and then there were two more after that, and then that was the end of our careers as filmmakers. Um, I would like to say something about freedom. Uh, we've had that same kind of freedom at Dimension. The same sub-distributors continue to faithfully uh, um, finance the films, and um, we were able to introduce ideas into them that the major studios in those days would not address. Um, so uh, someone once called me an idea smuggler, and uh, I, I thought that was a great uh, compliment. Um, what I, uh, because I'm a natural born clown, I made, uh, I, I wrote comedies basically. I was the person who did the final rewrite on all the scripts. Uh, one of them I wrote completely, my last one I wrote completely by myself because I got sick and I had time to write it. Prior to that, all the filming had been rushed and so we would usually hire a, uh, a writer to do the first draft um, and according to the rules of the Writers Guild of America, of which we were both members, the person who writes the first draft gets first position uh, <laughs> uh, on the screen credits. So that's fine, and, you know, but ultimately these are uh, a product of my husband's and my values, and uh, they are, um, they address the issues of the day. They really do. They're not to, uh, sex and violence comedies. They are ideas, they are uh, vehicles for ideas, and they are, of course, placed in a uh, pretty uh, Southern California setting. Uh, there was one other requirement. All the actors had to be very nice looking, and, uh, well, and a good thing for the nudity, I might add. And so, uh, uh, beyond that, they didn't seem to care or if they cared, they didn't know how to express it, so we got away with it. You can view it either way. And uh, so I believe Dave will endorse the idea that that's why they survived. Indeed, yeah. Um, unfortunately, Dimension Pictures went into bankruptcy and the negatives for these films were lost, which is why they've been so hard to see for so long. And we have recently been able to restore them from the unfortunately very badly faded prints that Stephanie kept and kept with UCLA for a while, but the color was so much evaporated, we basically had to sit down with Stephanie and color grade every single frame in all three of these films. And uh, thanks to Stephanie's amazing memory, they are now look as they should, and hopefully they'll be getting back in circulation pretty soon. <coughs> Now, if you want to hear about where did these ideas come from, um, <clears throat> I was uh, very interested before uh, I came to filmmaking in political sociology. And um, I first went to the University of California at Los Angeles, known as UCLA. And after two years, I transferred up to the University of California in Berkeley, which was a hotbed of political activism. And uh, all I did was read and listen and read some more and listen 
and occasionally talk and argue. And uh, the outcome, uh, and I then went for several years to graduate school there. And while I was there, I also went to a theater in Berkeley, uh, which uh, was managed by a very famous American film critic, Pauline Kael. Uh, she wasn't a critic at that point, but she was an excellent programmer. And I was able to see um, some great European films of the time and some unusual American ones. And um, it was there that, for example, I for the first time saw uh, La Strada, The Seventh Seal, and uh, Paths of Glory, and uh, a Brazilian film that is very dear to my heart and is not a great film, but I love it, so I won't even bother uh, pronouncing the Portuguese uh, title for it because it never played in America. So, um, while I was watching these films, especially when I saw The Seventh Seal, I said to myself, oh, I would love to have made that film. That's what I want to do. I want to make a film like that. Well, <clears throat> I grew up in Southern California, and my family knew a number of people who worked in the film industry, but they were useless. <laughs> They were of no help, whatever. Um, and finally, uh, it was my romantic life that helped me. I dated a cinematographer who was very bold, very daring. He went over all over the world, and he did the underwater cinematography for one of the uh, television uh, stations there. And um, <clears throat> I asked him, you know, how did you do it? And he said, oh, well, I just talked you know, bought a camera and taught myself how to use it, and then I went around the world. And he, uh, he, he was, as I say, extremely physically daring, none of which I was. He was also very large and very strong, and I looked at him and I said, how can I do this? And he said, well, there is a school at the University of Southern California, the oldest one in the world, actually, that taught cinema, and you could go there, you could apply. So uh, before doing that, I decided to go to one of my old family friends who was at that time head of the um, film department at, the, at UCLA. His name was William Melnitz, and he was a, um, a, uh, a student of Max Reinhardt's, if you've ever heard of Max Reinhardt. A few of you may have, I hope. He was a great producer in Germany. And um, of both stage and I believe some films. Am I right? Oh, many. So uh, <clears throat> I went to him and I said, "What should I do?" And he said, "Don't come to UCLA. Whatever you do." And so uh, he explained to me why I would have to go through a long bureaucratic process, even though you know I had gone to graduate school, of uh, <clears throat> learning how to sew costumes and learning how to build and paint sets, he said, that's a waste of time. You should go to a school where you will not get a theater foundation, but where you will be taught how to be a technician. And he said, go to USC. So uh, I went to USC, and I met the uh, chairman of the Depar uh, Department of Cinema. Now it's the School of Cinematic Arts, and it's massive, and it was uh, endowed by George Lucas. It's got this gorgeous building and all these modern facilities. But then it was in a converted stable. What year are we talking about here? Uh, nine, let me see. 1962. So I went there, uh, went there and uh, I met the chairman of the department and I saw the students running around with their equipment and I saw they were all male. And I saw they could lift this heavy equipment. And I knew I couldn't. I mean, I'm not a weak person, but I knew I couldn't lift that equipment. And film equipment in those days was much bigger and heavier than it is today. Um, so uh, I said to him, I'd like to enroll and I'd like to learn how to make films, but uh, I don't think I'll be able to lift the equipment. And he said the most wonderful thing to me possible, that was possible to say. He said, so you'll lift what you can. <laughs> and he, uh, I was admitted. Uh, you had to, you know, be screened. But I was admitted. 
and um, I lifted what I could, and I never heard a negative word from any of my male fellow students about that. They were very uh, understanding. Um, <clears throat> and it is there that I met my husband and producer. Uh, I think, according to the faculty, this was the first marriage uh, forever in that school. Uh, and of course, that's because there were no women, you know. <laughs> so uh, that was pretty obvious. Uh, but I did learn a great deal there uh, about how to be a technician. And I looked around at my fellow students who were uh, very nice people, you know, uh, friendly, encouraging. Uh, we talked about a, a, a lot about the equipment, but I realized that I had something that almost none of them had, which was a liberal arts education. And uh, so uh, while they could uh, operate cameras and they could do lighting and they could all do all these wonderful technical things, they couldn't really become, and I hate to use this word and I'm not necessarily applying it to myself, but I thought it at the time, they couldn't become auteurs. So um, with my enormous appreciation for French film, I thought, well, but I could. <laughs> and so um, <clears throat> that's how I started. <laughs> and now you and see the end. Otherwise. Well, you were accepted into the uh, DGA apprenticeship program as the first woman, I believe. No, I was never uh, accepted by the, uh, by the DGA for that. What they had was, at the end of my uh, studies, they offered a fellowship. And uh, so um, I and two of my fellow students went there, uh, accompanied by the chairman of the department. And I met, uh, for those of you who are cinephiles, some amazing people there. The most prominent one uh, in my eyes that you will probably recognize too is Joseph von Sternberg, uh, because his films are being shown here now, I believe. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, uh, they interviewed each of us separately. And then uh, the professor who accompanied us uh, told me later they discussed all of us and our work. And uh, there w the strong argument against me was that I was a woman and no women get to direct films. So giving me the money, even if I was the worthiest candidate, uh, would you know, be a waste of money. And then Joseph von Sternberg and Leo McCary, I don't know if you know him, but he was also a very famous American uh, film director, stepped in and said, that's not the way to think about this. The way to think about this is what they said and what your you know, instincts are about who would make a, a director. And they brought around the others to the belief that I was the one to vote for. So that's how I got the fellowship. And that is for Joseph von Sternberg and Leo McCary, believe me. <laughs> uh, if for any of you who know American films in some depth, Leo McCary directed some films. They weren't the only ones he did, but he was a very religious Catholic and he directed some films about church people, about uh, priests and nuns, uh, one of which was called Going My Way, and the other was called The Bells of St. Mary's, and it starred Bing Crosby and Ingrid Bergman. And um, <clears throat> it was a lovely romance that was, of course, another was, was a non-romance because he was a priest and she was a nun and they were dedicated people. And in the end, she goes away with tuberculosis, and we don't know if she will ever recover, and we're left with that sad feeling. But uh, it, it, he, he was, his films were infinitely sympathetic and uh, a lot of fun to watch, a lot of humor in them. And he also did comedies before that as films. Okay. <laughs> All right. Stephanie is too modest to admit to this, but as near as I can tell, uh, she was the only woman making narrative films in America between Ida Lupino and Elaine May, which was a fairly considerable gap. And I just wonder what even made you think 
you could enter into this field? Or did you even think about it? You just did it. Yes, I thought about it, and I decided I had only one life, and I wasn't afraid to be a pioneer, and so I did it. I mean, I just decided I'm going to do it. I'm going to be a director. People have since then called me a woman director, and I really resent that. I don't like that term. You're a director. You're a doctor. You know, you're a lawyer. You, you are your work, and that's all you are. Now, some people have said I bring a different perspective. That's fine, but I know that perspective is made up of many things. It's made up of education. It's made up of life experience. Yes, it's made up of growing female, too, but that's only a part of it. Should we open up for some questions from uh, you folks? Anybody out there? Sir. Uh, there was a project that we, my husband and I, uh, bought the, temporarily bought a, uh, the rights to, called The Man in the High Castle by Philip Dick. And it was, you may know Philip Dick, all of you, he was a very famous science fiction writer whose work has been made into films since then. Um, <clears throat> and we adapted the novel, we changed it, in many ways, he had just died, and his agent uh, told us that he really liked the changes we made because he always thought that book was too long, disorganized, et cetera, et cetera. And we had organized it, you know, into a coherent uh, thread, uh, and we had uh, changed or enlarged some of the characters that were more desirable to, uh, and we uh, had actually uh, it, it was made up of German and Japanese characters as well as an American one. And we, uh, we were able to make them all sympathetic in their own way, even though representing things that uh, were in certain ways, uh, in the case of the German and Japanese, they were terrible. They represented war and occupation. But these were individuals, and they had their own visions, and they were different than that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we tried very hard to get it made, and uh, we uh, could not find anyone who would give us financial support. We tried, first of all, <coughs> in America, but you know, we, we only have private financing there, and then we <coughs> appealed to some European governments, and they've said, you know, go back to America. So <laughs> anyway, we never got to make it. Um, its final, uh, the last gasp of our version was, <clears throat> pardon me, I have to just drink something. We sent to the company of Dino De Laurentiis when it first uh, came to America. He moved there and he wanted to uh, make uh, American-made films. And uh, his translator and story editor was a, a, actually a published author here in Germany. His name was um, Sergio Diego Altieri, but um, he uh, wrote under the name of Alan Altieri. Uh, he eventually ended up heading the Giallo um, branch of Mondadori for a number of years. And uh, he has written a number of novels in Italian, not all of them of a giallo nature. And um, <clears throat> so anyway, he read our version, and he loved it. And he went, and he went to Dino De Laurentiis, and he said, you have to read this. So Dino De Laurentiis did read English, but when it came to scripted material, he wanted an Italian translation because he wanted to, you know, be sure he didn't miss any details. And so Sergio translated it for him. And uh, he said uh, he really liked the script, but he did not think it was commercial. And so um, as a consequence, um, we gave up. Uh, oh, and, but we tried once more with the help of Sergio, who knew a lot of people in Hollywood. 
And he, we had, had run out of money by then. He paid for the last um, payment to the agent so that we could keep the rights to it, which was very kind and generous of him. And he became, of course, our very dear friend. I should say one more thing about him. He's the person who uh, translated the George Martin uh, books that came, became known as Game of Thrones into Italian. Um, and also all of Dash, the newest version of Dashiell Hammett. Okay, back to my story and our story. I, he is a dear friend. He's uh, unfortunately dead now, and that's why I want to say these things, you know, in tribute. So uh, we tried, and he tried helping us, and we just couldn't get anyone interested. Um, <clears throat> so we gave up, and at that point, we just stopped making, uh, making it, any efforts to make films of any sort. Now, as, what, as far as what happened to the man in the high castle, it was the daughter of Philip K. Dick who eventually got it made for um, streaming uh, for, uh, you know, he, as a series, as a television series, and it was streamed. Um, I don't know what adaptation of the book was made or anything because honestly, after the time we spent and invested in trying to get it made, I didn't have the heart to see what decisions other people had made. And that may be a terrible thing to admit, but so I'm terrible, what can I say? <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Stephanie, uh, first of all, thank you, Stephanie and, and Dave, for Hello. this talk. <laughs> it's a pleasure. But. Going back to Pauline Kael's program, I'm dying of curiosity to know what that Brazilian title was, or was it a Glauber Rocha film, perhaps? A new uh, wave of Brazilian it cinema? Have been much earlier than that. No, it I'm was earlier. No. Like much 50s. earlier. Limite by Mario Peixoto, a silent film that was quite avant garde. She didn't show silent films. She did very well, likely she, Orfeo Negro, which was a huge... Orfeo Negro was a French film, Marcel Carnet. Oh, of course. My <laughs> but I'm just wondering what Brazilian film it was. Black Orpheus, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, she showed uh, mostly contemporary European films. Yes, that's uh, why I'm curious course, about this Brazilian film. Yes, well, it just got in there, and it had a marvelous song. Are, are you from Brazil? Uh, uh, partly. I'm American, but I grew up in Brazil. Okay, well, if I tell you the title, you know, I'll embarrass myself because I No, can't. no, but even the it's filmmaker. Called, it's called um, El Cangaciero, I think. Oh, yes, El Cangaciero. Okay, okay. I have it. Yes. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a f and it had a famous song with o it. Olemo la Handeira, uh, a film, a right. uh, song about a... Uh, uh, an embroidery. Which maker. I, to this, I, I read about the uh, gang, by the way, the robbers who uh, became, uh, the film was based on, so I know about all of that, and uh, uh, they I were- I never would have uh, thought of that title, but thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, it's a great uh, pleasure to be sitting in front of you having read your names in books about cult movies and uh, women directors <laughs> over the years. And the first film I ever saw by you was probably in the late 1980s, um, which was circulating probably on a bootleg VHS, yeah. <laughs> was uh, Terminal Island, which uh, struck me for lots and lots of reasons about how invigorating it was, how dramatic it was, how the representations of women were very different than I'd seen in more conventional commercial cinema. So I'd just love to hear you talk about the making of that film. Uh, well, that was the physically hardest film that I ever made. It was hard for me, it was hard for the crew, it was hard for the actors. Would you like to know the physical circumstances first, or would you like to know why uh, we wrote the film and, okay. You'd like to know why we wrote the film. Well, uh, because I was asked, th there were uh, 
women's prison films out then that were uh, making a lot of money. They were shot in the Philippines. They were cheaply made. Um, <clears throat> some of them had taken their, because they were made mostly by Roger Corman, uh, or almost, I would say, exclusively. And so they had taken, uh, how shall I put it, uh, a certain amount of uh, uh, information from the student nurses, and they tried to put various uh, uh, kinds of issues of social conflict into them too. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. I mean, how much social conflict can you have in a, a women's prison where they're supposed to be briefly dressed and they're always fighting and so forth? But it happened. Um, <clears throat> and uh, finally, the sub-distributors came to our company and said, um, would you make one of those for us? And uh, so the head of the company said, yes. And he said, that's what you're gonna make. And I said, I can't. I'm sorry, I just can't. I will not make a women's prison picture, but I will, after going home and thinking about it, make a Devil's Island picture for you, in which a group of prisoners are isolated on an island, prisoners of both sexes, and what kind of social organization they create and what kind of social destruction do they do? And uh, my goal in all of this ultimately was to tell a story in which some people are irredeemable. They are obviously uh, psychopaths. They are, uh, they can't function uh, in, in any kind of cooperative social situation. And then there are others that are redeemable. And I wanted the theme to be about ultimate redemption, not in the re re religious sense, but in the societal sense, that some people can be brought back uh, and um, they can form their own society, which they do at the end on the island after much fighting, bloodletting, and uh, abuse, especially of the women who are in very sh short supply and so are used as slaves until they escape. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so that was Terminal Island. We've just finished the restoration on that one, so maybe John Luca will show it next year. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it has some humor in it too, by the way. But the critics were very offended by some of the humor. They said it was barnyard humor. My thought was, well, yes, and this is appropriate for this kind of story. <laughs> we're basically in a human barnyard. Right. So, you know, but anyway. Um, hi, I read from over here. Um, I really enjoyed group marriage yesterday, and. I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about the writing of the, the sort of the sexual politics involved there, not only with the six people in the marriage, but also the, the gay neighbors as well. I'm just very interested in that. I'm glad you noticed the gay neighbors. No, I really am, uh, because I don't know of any film, maybe there are, I'm not a film archivist and historian like Dave is, but I don't know of any other gay marriage that took place in a film before that. And when it was initially shown, a uh, premiered for an audience, the reaction was really delightful. They burst out laughing and then they applauded. Uh, and this was in 1972. Uh, so uh, it, it's interesting to see how far ahead, not everywhere, but some places people are uh, far ahead of law and custom. Uh, <clears throat> now, you wanted to know uh, what uh, rules we had. Is that was your, was your question about the portrayal of sex in group marriage? Yeah, how you came up with the sort of the dynamics of the sexual politics of the prostitutes. <clears throat> well, the sexual politics were pretty easy. I mean, first of all, the plot had to move quickly. Secondly, um, <clears throat> Obviously, you have six people, and six people are going to be different, have different goals, uh, and deal with the uh, question of sex differently. Uh, those were the sexual politics of the day. Again, 
you might say the film was avant-garde in the sense of um, convention, but not in, in terms of, you know, the turmoil that was going on under the convention. And uh, I, I would like to say one th more thing about it. This was an R-rated film, and an R in those days, and this governed all my films, R-rated films meant that you could show nudity, you should co could show caressing of bodies, but you could not show, I think I said this earlier, uh, actual uh, intercourse, uh, for which I am now grateful, because when people show it, it's always the same, and maybe I've just gotten too old or something, but that's when I go out and get a bowl of popcorn or something else, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> because it's, that's when you can no longer do anything really different. But we, uh, I, I was able to make things sensual, and I tried to make them sensual in different ways, some of them comically, uh, some of them, uh, uh, you know, more uh, surreally, more dreamily, as for the final scene where uh, the couple have this marriage bed and we first see them through the uh, curtains and then the curtains open up and there they are lying in this bed of white fur and, uh, you know, it was, I, I thought at least it was very sensual. And uh, so, uh, that's about all I can answer, unless you have a more specific question about the sexual politics. The fact that the women were passive, they were equally aggressive. Uh, what else uh, is well, it? I, I was reading for, I, I guess I expect to find an answer to this sort of thought. I'll come back to the society before this as well. So I was just waiting for my answer. It did actually uh, for the women. Mm -hmm. I kept going back to this because I would, I guess, I would let me run better pressure and from so uh, bring this to societal morality and people would come back up and blow up the whole thing. Well, uh, they did blow up the car. I mean, not everyone approved. And when it got on the news, uh, you know, it, uh, it brought out uh, haters. They're always around looking for a cause. Uh, as far as the ending, why shouldn't it work? Uh, I mean, these people were well motivated. Uh, they weren't officially married. They were going off to make a point so they could have a court case, which was t to <clears throat> marry and uh, defy the law. And uh, so uh, as far as whether it worked, uh, maybe it did, maybe it didn't. That's the next film, and they never let me make that one, you know. But it ended happily. <laughs> okay. Where did the microphone Hi. go? Oh, that's, I'm so sorry. Hello. Uh, hello, I'm in the back. Ah. Hello. Hi. Uh, I really enjoyed your um, film, Working Girls. And you said you studied sociology. And the thing that came through to me in Working Girls, it was almost like slightly utopian, like communitarian idea of like people, women, mostly women coming together, supporting each other. So I'm wondering how your degree influenced kind of your outlook politically. And obviously it's a time of massive social change in the US. So like, how did that feed into you sort of forming and writing your films and anyway, yeah, thank you. Uh, I can't take all the credit for the communitarian part because the film distributors wanted that. <laughs> but uh, as far as they're getting along and supporting each other, uh, why not? I mean, uh, I had uh, female friends. We supported each other. It didn't seem so unusual to me. Why would they undermine each other? I, I mean, there is a little bit of undermining at the beginning when Honey brings home the uh, street musician and sleeps with him, and he turns around and uh, looks at uh, uh, Denise and uh, you know gets interested in her, and the next morning, uh, while she's eating breakfast, he comes down and tells her he loves her. So <laughs> that was, uh, I guess, uh, but that's about the only uh, strife there was there. Uh, as far as the political ideas, the story was about money and making money, 
and employment and underemployment. And um, <clears throat> those were uh, themes that I was very interested in because uh, obviously uh, that's, uh, that's the f what fuels all of us ultimately. And uh, so uh, I was able to uh, show different career paths that probably will end up very differently. Um, and that I also liked. The uh, middle one, uh, the woman who uh, went to work as a cocktail waitress, then became a stripper, then became the manager of the uh, nightclub who did not want to do this and uh, who ultimately, uh, although she had a brief sexual affair with the uh, young organized criminal, uh, <clears throat> knew what her career goal was to become a lawyer and ultimately to become a judge, and he certainly wasn't what she wanted. Uh, so uh, there was that. There was the uh, young woman who uh, came in poor and homeless and learned from a madman who was obsessed with money, how to make money, and uh, he left her actually a very ungenerous fi finder's fee before firing her. Uh, and usually it's two or three percent, he left her only one percent, which she generously shared equally with her uh, three other roommates, including the uh, street musician, and um, <clears throat> then she went off to make more money, but with a, the, uh, with a utopian socialist idea in her mind, which she expressed to them, which was, <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll make money, then I found a, uh, a business, and uh, in my business, we'll all share equally in the profits. So uh, we'll, if I had made the following film, we could have followed her and seen if that happened, but uh, that was the end of that. And, and then there is, of course, the artist who worked as a sign painter, and uh, she, um, <clears throat> she, no one bought her art. And maybe no one ever would, or maybe only when she's very old. So she was the one with the greatest life of uncertainty. She had her art, but she had no goal as far as what to do with it because the world had rejected her. So uh, I don't know if I've given you any more insight into uh, what you wanted to hear, but if I haven't, you have a more precise question. Please tell me. Silence, <laughs> okay. Uh, what about um, actors, direction? Did you like this part of your work, uh, the dri directing the, the actors and the actresses? Which was your relationship with this, this part of uh, filmmaking? And um, I, I was asking myself if your actors and actresses uh, realized the difference that there was in your films um, and not uh, in the other they could uh, work in? Thank uh, you. Well, it depended on what other films they worked in. Some of them worked in actually um, very well-known major studio films. Um, some of them didn't. Some of them had no careers. Um, working with them, uh, mostly was a pleasure. Uh, they were ve very well motivated. We all got along. There were a few that were very difficult. And uh, there's one story I suppose I should tell you about group marriage. I won't name the actor. But he kept on doing business to distract people from looking at the other actors in a scene. And we would suddenly come up with some movement or take something or do something like that. And I talked to him about it and he got very angry. And I said, all right, you know, I'll handle it. And what I did was whenever he started doing this, I just told the cameraman, don't, you know, include him in the scene. So we kept him out of the scene when he did that. So that's how he sabotaged himself. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but most everybody else was eager to do their best work, and I think they did. Uh, some of them were, you know, less experienced, and sometimes it showed. 
But that doesn't matter, I mean, from what you're asking about. Now, there was one thing that we didn't have, one luxury, and I always think of the uh, British director, Mike Lee, when I think of this, who had this, and I'm a great admirer of his work, by the way, but he always had this great luxury of working maybe for six weeks in advance, or maybe even more, months in advance, with the actors, and they would do improvisations together. And actually, I think some of his scripts were actually just taken from those improvisations. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a more of an authoritarian than that. I want them to say my lines, but I wish I had been able to have more rehearsal time. We had no rehearsal time because we didn't have the money. We had to start shooting immediately. I had one <coughs> day in which we would have a reading, and that was it. And uh, that is one of my greatest regrets about uh, the limited amount of money we had. It's a good question you asked. Um, I came to your work via the, the uh, to your films via the work of Danny Peary, and I wondered if you'd um, if you were aware of how um, how much he championed your your work. And secondly, you mentioned earlier that uh, you, you started to talk about the Velvet Vampire, and I'd love to hear you talk about the making of the Velvet Vampire. That was two things. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear, I heard about Dan Peary, and I'll talk about him, but I didn't hear about... Uh, you touched briefly earlier on, on um, the Velvet Vampire and Mario Bava, and I'd love to hear the rest, the, like you, you said you were gonna talk about that later, and I'd love to hear you talk about ma the making of that film. Okay, well, uh, okay, first let me, uh, talk about Dan Peary. He was a wonderful person. Is he still alive? Yes, he is. Oh, good. Well, please give him my best regards. Um, yes, he did like my films. And uh, I think there was, uh, he came from Wisconsin or Minnesota, didn't he? And there was a film, they had a film uh, a journal up there, which, which was very widely respected. I, I think it was called something like well, I don't remember. It's called The Velvet Light Trap, interestingly and poetically. Yeah. So uh, uh, as far as The Velvet Vampire, I stole one shot, not the same, I didn't exactly, but there was one shot I did <coughs> in my film, The Velvet Vampire, that I saw in a Mario Bava film, and I loved it, and it was a very simple thing. It started on the vampire, and then she was sitting in this throne-like chair, and then she sort of moved forward because she was watching the young couple sleeping, and when we did, we saw that upside down behind her, when she moved, she revealed a, uh, a dead body. That's all it was. <laughs> but uh, other than that, our films are very different, as you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, well, that's a good question. Uh, I made it because I had this terrible premonition that I would not be able to make many films. And I wanted to explore within genre films every genre that I could. And um, <clears throat> for Roger, before, while well, I was his assistant, before I, uh, be, he hired me to direct films, um, I had read up on vampires. He wanted to know something about vampires, and I used that in when I would uh, shoot new uh, uh, footage for him in films that he had bought from other countries. So uh, I once introduced a vampire. So uh, <clears throat> I thought to myself, this is a great genre, f uh, you know, film genre, and uh, why don't I try to make it? such a film, my husband and I talked about it, we agreed, let's do it. And so um, <clears throat> we hired a very good uh, playwright named Yale Udoff to do the first script, which he did. And uh, I will say that if anybody, uh, except for the author uh, that we hired for the student nurses, who was very good also, uh, more of his lines remain in the film. Uh, and um, we lived in Southern California. We had no money. 
So we discussed, we have to rethink this. What are we going to use for Transylvania, for the snowy, you know, uh, pine tree covered mountains of Transylvania? And uh, it was obvious that something as austere and remote and creepy could be found in the desert of which we have an abundance. In fact, uh, we live in an arid, semi-arid area in Los Angeles. So we shot it in uh, what was at the time called Joshua, Joshua Tree National Monument, which has since recently, thanks to um, uh, Barack Obama, become the Joshua Tree National Park. And um, we, uh, it, it was, very difficult for the crew and me because we all kept walking into cacti with thorns and we were all, you know, at the end of the day we all had de to de thorn ourselves. Um, there were also uh, other physical dangers in the desert uh, like sandstorms uh, which would suddenly come up and then die off. And in fact in one sequence you see a sandstorm when, the, uh, when a bus uh, carrying the vampire and the woman trying to escape her uh, are both on it. And uh, the woman trying to escape her thumbs down, this is most unusual, a greyhound bus that comes out of a sandstorm and uh, drives them both back to Los Angeles. Um, <clears throat> my cameraman, who uh, was French, uh, he was, except for one film, always my cameraman, uh, got on the bus to uh, film it, and to his delight, he discovered the Greyhound bus driver was also a Frenchman, so you never know what <laughs> comes out of the desert. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the Velvet Vampire was uh, all, all shot on location, either in the desert or in private homes in Los Angeles, except for the one sequence where she walks past the church we start on the church in the daytime and then it, there's a dissolve tonight and she appears and she walks and she walks into an area with a fountain and murders a biker who is trying to attack her <laughs> and then goes on to a cocktail party. So, <laughs> any other questions about it? What was the most fun you had making any of your movies? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting you ask that question. Um, making my movies was fun. I can't isolate any individual film that was fun, but I will say this, that when I made my final film, The Working Girls, I had learned a lot. And I had less money than I ever had for any other film. And uh, just it, it cost uh, a third of what Terminal Island cost and what Group Marriage cost. But I had learned how to shoot quickly. And um, I knew how to do things that had never occurred to me before. So in that sense, uh, technically and aesthetically, it was the most fun. But they were all fun, really. I mean, I, as I look back, that, was, that is my definition of fun. Uh, you know, and that goes back to the working girls, too. Because, you know, there was a very famous uh, uh, Dutchman uh, named, uh, who was the chancellor of one of the universities of, in um, the Netherlands, uh, I believe during World War II and for a little while afterwards, I used to love to read him in translation. His name was Johan Hoitzinga, and if there's anyone from the Netherlands here, I, excuse me for my pronunciation, but I think that's how you pronounce it. Anyway, <clears throat> he uh, uh, wrote a book called Homo Ludens, Man Plays, and uh, it was all about the fact that, in fact, most of what we do is play. We learn certain things through play. They are rehearsals for our work. And then, in a sense, our work becomes play. And that has, has always been, uh, uh, 
he influenced me greatly, I must say, and that's always been my view. So it's very interesting you should ask that question because it has been fun to make those films and ultimately my whole life has been fun. <laughs> so there. Well, that's a lovely way of wrapping up this conversation. And Thank you. Thank you all Thank for coming you. out. Now, may I applaud back and say thank you for coming to meet me. To you. <laughs>